Okay, welcome to note set number 15. Um, so this is loosely based on section 6.4.3 of the textbook. Um, but I, as usual, or often anyway, have my own way of, of thinking about these ideas. Um, so I'll, I'll present my, my view and then you can uh, cross-correlate it with uh, Proacus and Monolacus' viewpoint. Uh, I'm not saying mine is right and theirs is wrong, just two different ways of, of explaining the same idea. Um, okay, so um, we're trying to define what a bandpass signal is, and then we're going to talk about sampling a bandpass signal uh, directly. Um, but before we start talking about sampling a bandpass signal, I want to spend a fair amount of time just talking about how we represent bandpass signals, what they are, how we represent them, and, and why we are interested in these things. Um, so we define a bandpass signal. Um, we can kind of see a nice picture down here that explains it, but basically it's a signal x of t. So it's a, a time domain signal, but it's one that has a Fourier transform x of f that's concentrated in some small band around some central frequency f0. So here's f0, and this thing is concentrated in some quote-unquote small band. So you know what is small will depend upon the application. I mean, we could be talking about you know, a couple hundred megahertz of, of bandwidth here. Um, but if F0 is a gigahertz or so, a um, couple hundred megahertz is small compared to a gigahertz. Um, but the main idea is that there's a, a, a chunk of it out here, and theoretically it's zero everywhere else except for out on the negative frequency axis where there is another chunk. And I'm showing the magnitude here. Um, and so the magnitude allows us to make a, a simple plot here. And uh, we are assuming that x is a, um, that x is a uh, real valued signal here. So our magnitude has, has even symmetry about the origin. Um, and that's, that's typical as to, you know, what we're, talking about in the real world. We're talking about real valued signals. Uh, but soon we'll be talking about complex valued signals and seeing why we care about them and where they come from. Um, but all signals that exist in the real world, um, even you know RF signals, radio frequency signals, which is really what we're talking about here, um, are real valued signals. So uh, we also define the concept of a bandwidth so that's the, the width of this chunk. Um, and we see that this is consistent with what we talk about for a, uh, uh, our definition of bandwidth for a low-pass signal. Um, for a low-pass signal, we assume that this left edge is right at um, DC. So then our bandwidth becomes just the upper edge, which would be the upper edge minus the lower edge, so it is consistent. So, um, I would like to point out before we move on that there is no constraint on where in the band F0 lies. In fact, F0 doesn't even really have to lie in the band, so there's a, a, you know, a, a fair amount of uh, arbitrariness as to where that F0 is, is located. Now, obviously, when we start talking about real value, you know, real signals in the real world, um, there is often a, an obvious choice of what we consider to be F0 uh, relative to the rest of the spectrum. And that, that often comes from, uh, you know, a particular carrier frequency. So if you've studied uh, communication systems, you'll know what I mean by a carrier frequency. So, um, you know, the scenario where we, where we usually run into these things is actually uh, one area is communications, another area is, is radar, um, but any field that uses RF or radio frequency signals um, would uh, require this definition of bandpass signals. 
And what we're going to do is take a look at something called the equivalent low-pass signal. And so systems that deal with RF signals, uh, so communication systems, radi radar uh, systems, uh, they don't work, they don't do their processing directly on the band, the received bandpass signal. They take that received signal and they convert it into something else first. And the thing they convert it into is we'll call the equivalent low-pass signal. There's, there's other names for it, um, but uh, that's what we'll call it. And uh, what we'll see is that the mathematics is uh, a natural generalization of the idea of a phaser, um, which um, you should have seen in your you know, sophomore level circuits class. And uh, you know, hopefully you didn't come out of there with a feeling that you know, phaser uh, ideas were intended to make things hard. In fact, they're intended to make things easy. Um, and so if you remember, the whole point of using a phaser was um, so that we could uh, avoid having to solve differential equations with um, forcing functions that were sinusoidal. Uh, so if we have a, a differential equation with a, a sinusoidal forcing function uh, or a sinusoidal input to a RLC circuit, um, we can solve that with an algebraic method as long as we're willing to convert into the phasor domain. Um, and so we'll see that the ideas here are, are um, almost exactly the same. So let's, let's review this idea of, of phasors. So um, the idea of um, phasor analysis is here's the actual voltage or current in a circuit that we're interested in analyzing. And what we do is we replace that real-valued sinusoid, time-varying sinusoid, by a complex DC value. So it's complex, but it's now no longer changing with time. And you can see that all we did really was pick off the amplitude and pick off the phase and, and write it as e to the j theta. Um, and once we have... So let me say it this way. If, if we have a uh, sinusoidal, uh, say, voltage source in a circuit, um, what we can do is convert that circuit that has resistors, inductors, and capacitors uh, with a sinusoidal source, we can convert it into a equivalent DC circuit with all sinusoidal sources replaced by their corresponding phasor value, um, and all inductors and capacitors replaced by a complex-valued resistor, what we call an impedance. And then we solve that, that circuit just using simple algebraic methods to find the output phasor, and then we convert that output phasor back to a time-varying sinusoid. So it's a, it's a nifty little sidestep, we allow ourselves to go over into complex valued things, um, and so that causes some of the challenge of it, but the payoff is that we no longer have a differential equation to solve. Now, that's not exactly how we're going to deal with it, um, as we'll see, but, um, but it captures the essence of, of what we're going to do. So to just see... Um, how we can relate this phaser idea to some of the terminology and ideas that we'll be seeing here in a more general setting. Um, I'm going to talk about this phaser idea from uh, following the steps that we'll use in just a little bit to get to the equivalent low-pass signal. So we start with our sinusoid, uh, just showing it here, and Euler's formula allows us to break it down into two parts. And we can see that we have the plus frequency and the negative frequency. And so on the, the diagram versus frequency, we get a, a delta function at F0 and a delta function at negative F0. So then our next step, and this is, I'm, I guarantee you, this is not how you did it in your circuits class, but um, just follow with me for a minute here. In your circuits class, you just identified amplitude and phase and and then immediately wrote it in this form. 
but we're going to follow a series of steps to get there that in the phaser case seems uh, excessive, but when we get to the, the more general case um, is uh, precisely the kinds of steps that we need to think about. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the analytic signal. And so in principle, we think of the analytic signal as just being getting rid of the negative frequency component. So we're left with only the positive frequency component. And so if we come back up to our Euler's formula, we can see, you know, here's the, the negative frequency component that we're going to get rid of. We'll keep this part, which is the positive frequency component. So that will be our analytic signal, and, and in our diagram here, we've just gotten rid of the, the, the negative frequency term and kept, kept the positive frequency term. Uh, so here we are writing just this term, and, and I've actually um, just dropped the, the, the half there. Um, so technically we keep, uh, I, I didn't really show it on the, on the diagram here, we keep the uh, positive side and, and multiply it by 2. Um, so just a, a small technical detail there. Now we have a, a complex exponential, and we can apply Euler's formula to that to get uh, its real and imaginary parts. So the real part is a cosine, and its imaginary part is a sine. So another way to think about this, let me get rid of some of this stuff here, clean it up just a little bit. Another way to think about what we did is we started with our original signal and just put it there, and then we added to it j times a 90 degree phase shift of our original signal. So that 90 degrees phase shift converts the cosine into a sine. Um, and then, so that's how we get to the analytic signal. And then the next step from the analytic signal is to shift it, frequency shift it down. So we now have just one spike up here, and we're going to move it down and put it at DC. So um, we can do that by multiplying using the frequency shift idea. We can multiply by e to the minus j 2 pi f 0 t. And, and that will bring it right down to dc. And uh, so we end up getting a, a structure that looks like that. And so we can see that this x sub l, and I used the subscript little l there, um, because we're going to be using that to represent low-pass equivalent signal. Um, but this is your phaser. And so you can see that doing these two steps is exactly the same thing that we did with the phaser of saying just extract the amplitude and extract the phase and write it like this. Okay, so that's the um, view of this. Um, and uh, so this is just, um, you know, discussing those ideas a little bit farther. Um, so our phaser we'll call an equivalent low-pass signal that represents the sinusoid, and that's why we used that subscript little L. And, uh, you know, this, this equivalent low-pass signal is complex-valued, um, even though our original signal, the sinusoid, uh, was real-valued. So we've replaced a real-valued high-frequency signal by a complex valued, in this case, DC, but in a more general setting, very low frequency um, content. So all we've done is suppress the negative part to create the analytic signal, and then frequency shift down uh, to DC. So doing these two steps, that's exactly what, uh, what we would do to get this phaser. So now let's extend this to um, a general bandpass signal. So here's a, a spectrum for a bandpass signal, and I'm just using a, a triangle, and I'm not fussing over the, you know, whether it has magnitude and, and phase or not. So I'm just showing it here. And uh, we can do the same 
uh, steps as we had before. So um, to get the analytic signal, we're just going to um, suppress the uh, negative frequency terms. And um, I'm leaving off the, the idea of multiplying by 2. Um, but technically, that's, that's what we should do at this point. Uh, and then, um, so that gives us the, uh, the spectrum of the analytic signal. And we know that if we look at this thing, since there's something here but zero over here, we know that it, uh, its magnitude does not have even symmetry. Um, therefore, um, XA of T, the corresponding signal in the time domain, um, will not be real valued. In fact, it'll be complex valued um, precisely because of this issue. And uh, I allude to um, you know, a page in, in the book by Peratt. Um, I, I know you're not following that book. If you, uh, It's not what we're using for this course. Um, but uh, Proacus and Monolacus has a, a similar section. In fact, we just went through that um, in, in uh, you know, a few note sets ago when we talked about some of the symmetry aspects um, and aspects of real and imaginary and so forth. Okay, so um, we can look at this yet a different way. So instead of just thinking about suppressing negative frequency components, um, we can think about it this way, where um, we define a system, and the, the uh, nice part of this approach is that we can think about this being at least a, 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 a system that could potentially closely be approximated. Um, this would be a, a equivalent or analogous to an, an ideal filter that can't really be implemented. Um, but we can think about the concept. So we define a system with a frequency response that looks like this. So for positive frequencies, it's going to multiply uh, by minus j. For negative frequencies, it will multiply by plus j. And right at the origin, we'll um, say that, it, it, that it's equal to 0. So if we apply that to a bandpass signal, um, like this, so we think about a, a, an X of T signal coming in being applied to, um, to a system that looks like that, its X of F is going to get multiplied by H of F. And you can verify uh, that if we then take the resulting signal, multiply it by J, and add it to the original, that um, the effect is to cancel the, the negative frequency components and effectively multiply the positive frequency components by 2. So this system is called a Hilbert transformer, or sometimes just a Hilbert transform. And so we can see that to create the analytic signal, what we do is we run our signal through a, a Hilbert transform, take J times the Hilbert transform, add it to the original signal, and we've got our analytic signal. So that's, that's one way of visualizing get the analytic signal. So once we have the analytic signal, to get the uh, equivalent low-pass signals for a transform, we just need to sh shift the analytic signal down by F0. Um, and so I'm showing the spectrum here um, shifted down. And so I call this the equivalent low-pass signal. Some authors call it the equivalent baseband signal. Um, and some books actually call it the pre-envelope. Um, so, uh, or maybe just the envelope. Yeah, the analytic signal some books call the pre-envelope. Um, no, let's see. Maybe I'm confused. Well, let's not worry about that since we don't really use that terminology in this course. Um, so, um, because our original bandpass signal might have a spectrum that you know looks like this, there's no guarantee that looking at just that part has any symmetry whatsoever around whatever frequency uh, 
we view as its um, you know f sub c. Therefore, once this thing ends up down here, there's no guarantee that it will have any symmetry. And therefore, uh, in general, this low-pass equivalent signal will be complex in general. Um, so, so we've got a way to think about converting our bandpass signal first into an analytic signal and then into the equivalent low-pass signal. And we've um, got a way to visualize that uh, in the frequency domain. And so now let's see what this looks like in, in the time domain. So um, if we consider taking the um, Hilbert transform, think about multiplying that in the uh, frequency domain, and then taking the inverse Fourier transform of that product and calling that x hat. So x hat of t would be called the um, Hilbert transform of x of t. We then take j times the Hilbert transform and add it to our original signal, and that gives us the analytic signal. So if we let x sub l of t be the notation that we use for the time domain uh, signal that corresponds to the x sub l of f that we've been talking about, then we can relate things this way. So x l of t is just a shifted down version of x a of t. So that means we need uh, e to the minus j 2 pi f 0 t. Uh, and you can see that what we're doing here is exactly the same steps that we talked about with the, the phaser case. And since we have an expression for the analytic signal in terms of the Hilbert transform, we can plug that right in there. And so we now want to talk about this um, uh, uh, very important form for the equivalent low-pass signal. Since we said that it was complex-valued, um, it's going to have an imaginary part and a, and a real part. And those are called um, the in-phase or I part is the real part. I know it's confusing um, to have the I part be the real part, but I stands here for in phase. And the quadrature part Q is actually the imaginary part. So if we write out XL of T is equal to XI of T plus XQ of T times J, where now both XI and XQ are considered to be real valued. So what we would like to do is find the relationship between our original bandpass signal and these I and Q components of the equivalent low-pass signal. Because in a lot of signal processing, the bandpass signal comes in through the antenna, then we process it, and ultimately we would like to generate the I and the Q signals, and those are what we then do our signal processing on rather than um, you know some bandpass version of the signal. So that's kind of where we're going here. So let's take a look at that and see if we can establish that. So we had that XL was just a frequency shifted down version of XA, therefore XA is a frequency shifted up version of XL. So that's just um, you know uh, flipping around that relationship that we had um, earlier. Oh, I forgot to mention, I'm breaking this into two parts, so, um, yeah, I should have mentioned that right away. Um, I'll keep the notes the same, but I'm, I'm breaking this into two different videos. Um, okay, so we've, we've got this relationship, and uh, we can now, for x sub l, we know that it, we've written it as x sub i of t, a real valued signal, plus j times xq of t, where xq of t is also real valued. And so um, xi of t is the, the real part of the low-pass equivalent signal, and xq of t is the imaginary part of the low-pass equivalent signal. 
And then what we're going to do is take this complex exponential out in front and write it out in its cosine sine form following Euler's formula. And so now we've got um, a real part and an imaginary part times a real part and an imaginary part. So we get um, all sorts of, of cross terms that we can um, figure out how they interact. Um, and then group them together into real parts and imaginary parts. So we've grouped the real parts up here and the imaginary parts on that line. And then finally, um, we have already seen that the analytic signal can be written as the real signal plus J times uh, the Hilbert transform. And so what that tells us, if we compare... Um, these two terms to these two terms, we can match them up. So we see that x of t is actually equal to uh, this thing that's inside that um, dashed rectangular box that I just uh, highlighted in uh, with my annotation pen. Uh, so now we have uh, the ability to write the real bandpass signal. So that's the RF signal. So it could be a communication signal, a radar signal, or some other RF signal um, that we imagine coming into our antenna. Um, we can represent that in terms of the low-pass in-phase term, the low-pass quadrature term, each of which get mo uh, modulated by a cosine and a sine. And you can see um, where the terms I and Q, in phase and quadrature. Uh, so the in phase term is with cosine, the quadrature term is with sine. Cosine and sine are 90 degrees out of phase, and so that's why the XQ is called the quadrature term. If we also match this up, or match the other terms up, we can get a representation for x hat. So remember, x hat is the Hilbert transform of x of t. Um, so we have a, a, a similar relationship for that, but um, we occasionally run into that, but it's, it's much less uh, important than uh, the representation for the bandpass signal itself. So what have we done so far? We've seen that the... Um, that we can convert a bandpass signal down into a complex-valued equivalent low-pass signal. Since the equivalent low-pass signal is complex-valued, we need to think about its real and imaginary parts. And so that was the IQ form. So we can think of the IQ form as a rectangular form to express this complex-valued low-pass equivalent signal. But we could also come up with a magnitude phase representation, which would be completely equivalent. So we're going to convert this rectangular form of the I and Q version of the ELP into a polar form. So um, we can just write it down uh, um, immediately. We don't even really have to think about this too much. Since XL of T is complex, it will have a polar form that can be written this way. Except now, since it's changing with time, its amplitude might change with time, and its phase uh, might change with time, and, and usually both of those do. Um, and since this is nothing more than just manipulating complex forms, since we had the IQ form being rectangular, uh, and here the envelope phase form being um, polar, we know how to convert rectangular to polar. So A of T is the envelope, and that envelope is just the magnitude of, of the uh, low-pass equivalent signal. And so we just take the, the real part and square it, the imaginary part, square it, take the square root, and that gives us the envelope, or the magnitude of the equivalent low-pass signal. And because of how we formed that, it's, you know, by definition, greater than or equal to zero. And then to get theta, we just simply take the imaginary part divided by the real part and take the arctan of that.
Um, and so now we have our, our theta of t. So we have a very simple way to go from the rectangular form to the um, envelope phase form, which the envelope phase form is really just a, a polar form version of this. And so now um, if we have envelope phase and we want to convert back, um, that's also easy. So we, we can write out our, our um, low pass equivalent signal in, in the envelope phase form and just writing this out uh, writing this complex exponential out in terms of its cosine and sine terms, uh, basically another form of, of Euler's formula, and then distributing the A of T throughout them, we get something that looks like this. And so now it's very easy to, to see those and say that the, uh, the in-phase term is just the envelope times cosine of the phase, and the quadrature term is A of T, the envelope, times the sine of the phase. Um, so it's now very easy to write down going either way. And really, these are not new forms. that We're just applying ideas of complex numbers here. So um, to link this back up to the bandpass signal, the original bandpass signal, so we, we've seen an envelope phase form for the, for the equivalent low-pass signal, but can we do something similar for the original bandpass signal? So, in fact, we can. So we have, here's our envelope phase form for our equivalent low-pass signal. We modulate it up, and it gives us the analytic signal. And so now we just pass this through uh, and combine it with that, and we get e to the j 2 pi f 0 t plus theta of t. Uh, and then we just take this and write it out in its cosine plus j sine form and multiply the a of t through both of those. And so we get something that has these two terms. Um, and then we recognize that, well, we have already seen that the analytic signal was just the original signal plus J times its Hilbert transform. Uh, and so it's pretty clear that these two things must be equal to each other. And so that leads us to uh, being able to write the bandpass signal. The, the real valued bandpass signal is just the envelope A of T times cosine 2 pi F 0 T plus theta of t. Um, and so that's a very fundamental result. And what we have just established is, is a very interesting idea. Any, and I mean literally, any bandpass signal, so any radar signal, any communication signal, any radio frequency signal that you're getting in a remote sensing setting, wireless, anything, any bandpass RF signal can be written in the following form. Some envelope out in front where the envelope is restricted to be um, non-negative plus or times cosine 2 pi f 0 t so there's the carrier frequency part of it plus some time varying appropriate time varying frequency uh, time varying phase rather um, and Combining these this way, we can create any bandpass signal. And the key here uh, to make it bandpass is that the envelope and the phase parts vary slowly compared to the carrier. Um, and that, So that's what makes it concentrated at a relatively narrow bandwidth relative to the carrier. If these things start changing very fast, and on an order equivalent to that amount, then, uh, you know, bets are off. We, the result is not necessarily a bandpass signal. Um, and so what we see here um, is we can make this uh, connection that we can interpret this structure and this structure very similarly to going from the sinusoid in your circuits class that had a fixed amplitude and fixed phase going to the phaser, which 
looked like this, except now with a fixed a and a fixed theta. Now we've extended that. We have a cosine with a time-varying amplitude, although the amplitude has to remain um, non-negative, a time-varying phase, and we can convert that immediately into an equivalent low-pass signal, which plays the role of a phaser in some sense, that now is just the role of the amplitude of the phaser is now time-varying and the phase of the of the quote unquote phaser is now also time varying. So hopefully this shows um, a nice transition from some ideas that you may have seen long ago, uh, but hopefully haven't completely forgotten uh, that are an idea useful for uh, circuit analysis really comes into play in a generalization in the ideas of um, signal processing of radar and communication signals. So we'll stop here uh, in this video and we'll pick up on slide 17 of note set 15 in the next video.